the Popol Vu. <laughs> I just love that title. It's fun. If you can't have fun with this stuff, well, what's it worth? Um, another uh, problematic is always the word text from that era of uh, post Spanish conquering. Uh, in this case of the Mayans, the Spanish, uh, through Cortez and, and those guys, marched through Mexico in about two years and put every, uh, you know, took control of everything. And then they started to turn south and the, uh, they trained their, their eyes on the Mayan civilization of largely Guatemala, southern Mexico, little Honduras. Yucatan Peninsula, Belize, a general area, a very sophisticated um, uh, culture, uh, one of the only uh, Mesoamerican cultures that had a fairly well-developed writing system. They didn't have an alphabet, but they had a, uh, a way, uh, it, it was called a syllabary, where they would have a symbol, often a little picture, that would, uh, instead of individual letters, meaning sounds that you group together into words, this would be individual pictures that create sounds uh, in terms of a full uh, uh, syllable of a word. Very sophisticated culture uh, for the time. And it, like, uh, like most of their neighbors, uh, came in for a hard time once the Spanish started knocking on their door. The bulk of the height of the Mayan civilization was already quite past by the time uh, the Spanish arrived. The Mayan civilization was primarily uh, from like the year 1000 or 100 rather, uh, 100 uh, CE to 900 CE. Uh, so it had already been pretty much uh, dissolved as a organized uh, uh, culture but, uh, for like half a millennium by the time the Spanish arrived. Uh, the um, Spanish and the combined Spanish and Mexican forces then uh, conquer the, uh, the Mayans, the people uh, known as the Quiche, um, in 1524. And about 30 years later, a progress uh, or a project of transcribing and translating the key uh, mythological cultural text of the Mayan culture uh, began and went on for like four or five years. And that is the Popol Vuh. It is a, uh, an extraordinary uh, little document. It is only if, if you, uh, the translation that we have uh, here by uh, by what's his name Tedlock is really pretty good, and if you if you read the whole thing, which actually you can find online pretty easily, um, is uh, it, it, it's only like a hundred pages or so, and that's with some of the words even kind of spread out, so there aren't too many words on the page, so you can really read through it very quickly, and it's a fun read. It's wacky in all the best ways that mythology tends to be. There are weird monsters, there are, you know, uh, really funny characters, there's just this out of this world magic and, and, and it's, it's just nutty and it's fun. But within it you can also see, just like all the best mythology around the world, an awful lot of their uh, their values coming through. You get a nice little tour of uh, of their culture and the way they think. the uh, The trick of it, of course, is that this text, the Popol Vuh, 
uh, which means Book of Council or Book of the People, uh, had been around for a long time. So again, we've got that same troubling history uh, of the text where it existed for a long time. It, the height of the Mayan culture had been several hundred years earlier. The, uh, the actual documents for it are a little uncertain. And it fell to a Spaniard priest to transcribe and translate it. Uh, Father, uh, Father Ximenez in 1701 uh, gathers together some materials and again puts it in uh, the original language in the Roman alphabet and the uh, um, and, and another column with Spanish and mixing in some uh, some uh, it's mix it's a mix of their their culture their uh, religious beliefs um, it, it's 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 a wild story of their uh, the mythology of the start of the world and uh, the, the creation of man and all of the little quirks and idiosyncrasies of the telling of it give more uh, give more flavor to what the actual story is and how it represents the people that uh, that it's uh, it's portraying uh, a lot of the stories a lot of the mythology is familiar across a broad range, as we shall see, uh, particularly uh, other elements of the mythology uh, can be seen in, uh, in many um, native cultures throughout uh, North, South, and Central Americas. The, uh, the degree of cross-cultural pollination with that, where they're just sort of, again, stealing ideas from one another, uh, is intriguing, uh, but it's something that scholars are still working on. The degree of cross-pollination that might be happening because of similarities with non-Western American sources is also a point of uh, great intrigue for many scholars, and we will see how that is sort of bubbling along. A lot of the same elements are popping up here that we see in mythologies around the world. Um, through all that, however, you also see this undercurrent of um, this undercurrent of resistance of a people who are facing something really quite dire. The Spanish were not kidding around. They were there to practice conquest, robbery, rape, and ultimately uh, push for genocide. And these stories can often be read as ways to deal with that, ways to get around that. So you see recurrent issues of uh, smarter but weaker um, uh, heroes outsmarting the much more powerful but dumber um, authorities. And that's an interesting little thing to watch work out because these are people who are writing, again, a full generation or more after the Spanish conquest. And they can't necessarily write about uh, how, you know, great heroes actually go up and spit in the eye of these Spanish overlords. But you can do it if you make it, well, it's just a harmless little tale about gods and animals and heroes and monsters. And it goes back to the, uh, the founding of our whole civilization. These stories have been around forever. But the spin you put on them can have new meaning when you start to realize how they're being told with a little wink wink, a little, yeah, this is about those scumbags who are enslaving us now.
Uh, the beginning of it has immediate resonances for anybody who has ever read anything anywhere at any time in the history of the universe. This is the beginning of the ancient word here in this place called Kishe. Shall we, here we shall inscribe, we shall implant the ancient word, the potential and source for everything done in the citadel of Kishe, in the nation of the Kishe people. Again, beginnings and endings. Always look at beginnings and endings. Here is the beginning. A uh, couple of things. Well, one, we're getting a lot of repetition again, which creates a certain stateliness. Here we are doing this, and we are doing this, and we are doing this. It gives a sense of the grandeur of what you're doing. It emphasizes with repetition. That ancient word, we shall implant the ancient word, and word here is capitalized. Don't put too much emphasis on, you know, capitalization in something like this. But calling something the word, what does that make anybody think of who might have, oh, I don't know, gone to Sunday school? What? The Bible, specifically the Gospel of John. The word of God. And that meaning between what the word is and what it symbolizes. The logos is the original Greek. And that sense of God's existence within the word, the language, that will come back. So that just jumps out right there. Also, that emphasis in the citadel of the Kish, in the Kishé, in the nation of the Kishé people. Uh, really, you know, showing some pride there. Showing a little uh, native dignity. These are people who have been uh, ruled by the interlopers, the conquerors, the colonists, for uh, 30 years, roughly. Skip down just a little. We shall write about this now amid the preaching of God in Christendom now. We shall bring it about because there is no longer blah, 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 blah. Uh, in Christendom now. So the text is telling you, okay, we are writing this while the people watching over our shoulders are Christians. But in fact, the guy who is doing a lot of the transcribing or writing of this is himself, Father Jimenez, a Christian. So is he writing this and saying, but now we're all Christians, so this is all good and true and we can trust this? Or is this the people reporting to Father Jimenez saying, well, yeah, this is all about the overseers. This is all about the Spanish watching us and everything that we do. That's Christendom to us. Does it signal a sincere change of faith? or perhaps just the pressure to pretend to. All of that is baked into this, because we don't know the answer. But they're putting it out front immediately to deal with. And that should color everything that comes along after that. Uh, significantly, the way creation happens is also familiar to anybody who has, oh, I don't know, read anything about the creation of the world in any of the world's traditions. There is not yet one person, one animal, bird, fish, crab, tree, rock, hollow, canyon, meadow, forest. Only the sky alone is there. The face of the earth is not clear. Only the sea alone is pooled under the sky. There is nothing whatever gathered together. There's nothing but there is a sky and there is sea, and those two are clearly separated. That, if you read Genesis closely, is the creation of the world, where there is the welter and waste, there is chaos, and there is an emphasis on the only thing that really exists, in a way, is water. And that water emphasis 
creation out of water we see in Genesis. We see in the story uh, Enuma Elish from Mesopotamia. We see it in the cosmogony of a Greek figure named Hesiod. We see this creation out of water. That is a recurrent theme throughout multiple world religions. Now, groups of uh, scholars who operate in the wake of a, uh, uh, a guy named Carl Gustav Jung look at that and say, well, that means that there's some sort of um, uh, extra material truth to our watery nature so that we all dream in the same images of water. We all have the same uh, unconscious relationship to water, to some primal element that transcends distance across the earth. We are all born of water, and so we all have this same relationship to water, and so the mythology is going to echo that and signal to us that, well, yeah, we all think about water the same way. Or everybody just notices that when a lady's about to have a baby, there's a puddle. All of these elements are flowing through that. Whatever there is that might be is simply not there. Only the pooled water, only the calm sea, only it alone is pooled. Again, the repetition, the emphasis. There are many different aspects of the deity, the creator, uh, there is essentially a polytheism element to this. There are many gods, or at least aspects of gods. And again, the connection with Catholicism and the, uh, the trinity of the, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all there. So when you are a priest transcribing all of this, are you selecting certain details that have resonance for biblical precedent? Maybe. I always look for a part of our psalms. Maybe. But he's also trying to be, and he is generally regarded, this is not just any old priest, this guy was actually a very well respected scholar of his day. Uh, is he, you know, the world of uh, anthropology is essentially being invented. The whole discipline of ethnography and study of human peoples is was not a thing before this. You can't trust any of them. So. You can't trust any of them, but you have to deal with them and see individually, well, what can you trust? You can just dispel it all and say, well, I don't know about any of that. You can say that about absolutely anything any book ever. I don't know who wrote that, so I can't believe it. That Einstein guy, <laughs> look at his hair. I didn't take him seriously. But there was a black hole spotted this past week that people said confirmed exactly what Einstein said. Oh, it's been there. Yeah, but we couldn't see it. The evidence comes in over time. Our perceptions always get adjusted to new evidence. But in the meantime, this is the evidence that we have, and we have to judge it critically. How much can we lean on this? What can we take and test and say, well, all right, that seems solid. Or that other thing, I don't know about that. That's he's not squishy. A source. What's that? I don't think he's a credible source. You don't, don't think, think he's a credible think source, think but he's not I, I purporting to be a source. I, he is recording okay, other but. sources, <laughs> multiple other sources, okay. oral traditions. <laughs> Artifacts, lots of people telling him different stories, okay. some uh, written materials, all of this is up in the air. And we don't have a whole lot of that material to go on, to judge against. This is what we have. For some reason, this was well preserved, probably because it was the Spanish and they were more careful about it and trying to save anything in uh, in Central America. It's a very wet climate. It's very hard to keep, uh, keep paper, certainly, or any records. So here a written, uh, a written record can be preserved, and that's what we have. 
So we can either dispel it entirely or we can say, okay, this is all we have. Let's see what little hesitations we have about it. Let's see what we have to look at it through and judge it as best we can for whatever good we can take of it. Because dispelling it entirely just robs us of any value it might have. Okay, that is fine. Uh, notice as well, then, we'll keep going on this. <laughs> Let it be this way, think about it, this water should be removed, emptied out for the formation of the Earth's own plate and platform. Then should come the sowing, the dawning of the sky Earth, the water removed, meaning separated distinguishing land from sea, this new element of land. So now there is land, there is sea, and there is sky. They are distinguishing. Creation is an act of division. We saw this in Genesis. And God created this, and God created that, and it was good, and it was different. And it is a process of differentiating and creating order. Separation is creation in this story as with that. And let me see if we can find another echo that perhaps might sound like something out of Sunday school. And then the earth arose before them. It was simply their word that brought it forth. From the forming of the earth, they said earth. It arose suddenly and just like a cloud, like a mist now forming, unfolding. Then the mountains were separated from water. All at once the great mountains came forth. For the forming of the earth, they said earth. Who is they? The gods. The element of the one god, or the multiple elements of the one god. But they say earth, and earth exists. That's Genesis. God said, let there be light, and there was and it was good. It is an act of spontaneous generation based on will. Just saying the word significantly. The language creates the reality. I have to bring that point for a reason. How is it related, like, uh, the whole with Genesis? Was they, like, the creation is very, like, similar? Like, the order, like, and then, like, they talk about a flood as well, Genesis as well. You also mentioned a flood as well. There's a so flood. how is this all this related? Like, these people are, like, far, far away. Yeah. They know about, like, or, like... Well, again... Should we not factor in reality? <laughs> oh, well, if you're going to lob a grenade, I like, can, reality into I this... I can argue that... We haven't even gotten to the talking parrot monster, and you're going to start talking reality? No, because it's, it's hard to like wrap my mind around understanding this text. It's really freaky weird. <laughs> they should just make a movie. So the ex <laughs> this is too weird for Hollywood, honestly. The example of the flood is very significant, though. We have another flood story in here. They create mankind. Gods create mankind. And, of course, they botch it. They create mankind twice because the first one they make out of mud, and he just sort of melts away. And then the others they make out of wood, and they're just wood. What the hell? And then they say, you know what? Uh, let's clean slate this. Well, let's just make it all go away. So they bring a flood. And gee, what does that sound like? And you're right. There are other instances. Now, the flood story in Gilgamesh sounds an awful lot like the flood story in Noah. And there, obviously, over a period of time, in roughly the same corner of the world, there's the possibility that wandering nomads or shepherds or whatever the hell they were might have bumped into one another and exchange stories about, oh, well, how do you think we got here? Well, I think there was the flood, and then there was a the guy, and he lived, and everybody else died. Uh, hey, that's a good idea, but, you know, I think it went this way. Um, that sort of possibility is very much there. But, yeah, when you're dealing with somebody across the ocean, 
then suddenly it becomes more complicated. Now, you can get into a lot of different theories with that. Number one, we are talking about religious texts here. And maybe God just decided that, okay, things are going to happen to the whole world, and everybody's going to know it, and they're going to take it in their way, and okay with that. That's like the religious uh, kind of point of view. Yeah. Because if you talk to us, so I, I grew up like around religious people, and everything is taken by faith. Yeah. Uh, nobody can contradict the Bible. And it's like, and I asked them, like, but what is the origin of God? <laughs> like, if I want to believe in God, like, they can't, they, you know, this is like, well, it's a mystery and can't even question it. Yeah, you, you, religion, most religions as we know them, and here we're going a little bit far afield, but I'll go uh, for a little bit. Uh, most religions do come up against that uh, that question of faith. Do come up against that uh, uh, what uh, what one later philosopher named Kierkegaard called a leap of faith. At a certain point, you can't imagine too much more, so you just gotta <laughs> buy into it. The uh, the prevailing view among uh, again, we're talking about like. The European uh, Renaissance here. So the prevailing view up to that point among the Europeans would have been the, uh, the middle, uh, the medieval perspective that we we cannot know the mind of God. We are, you know, God's God's like getting fifteen hundred on the SATs. I'm barely scraping by with seven hundred. Uh, how you know he, he 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 different pay grade. So how, who am I to question these things? But that question of faith is always baked into it, and it's very hard to come up uh, against. But the whole issue with the Renaissance, and that's where this effort of ethnography and anthropology is really coming out of, is that human beings, through the power of reason, should ask these questions should push back and try and expand the scope and don't take God uh, as, 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 you know, as, as a no trespassing zone. You have to have free inquiry. You have to push beyond it because without that, then we're still all just shuddering in a cave somewhere, looking at shadows on a wall. We need to challenge our own understanding of the world in order to understand anything in the world. And that's what I think you see here. That's what I think you see with the flood. The, the, the creation of man is very much a, uh, a similar trajectory with some notable exceptions. In the, uh, the Judeo-Christian creation that we, we have in, uh, in Genesis, uh, God seems to get it right the first time. He goes to create man. He just pinches off, depending on the story you get, pinches off a little piece of mud. Man is made of mud. Remember that. Folds it into a little man, and boom, there he is. That argument of Adam's perfection as being handmade by God, and if God is perfect, then everything God does is perfect, and so something handmade by God himself has to be perfect. Yeah, exactly, in his image. But then why does Adam eat the apple? Why does he eat the fruit? Why does he fall? Why do the descendants of Adam then start to uh, degenerate to the point where when you get to the generation of Noah, 10 generations later, uh, they all have to be wiped out. Like, and that's exactly why I question, what is the purpose of, like, if God knows everything, things are like that, knows everything, even, you know, how many hair you have in your hair. Yeah, that's and, good thing. Um, but then, if he knows everything, what would be the purpose of, like, Putting humanity through all this, like why would we? Like TV show. <laughs> yeah, TV. It's a 
Yeah, the the perfectibility or the perfection of God is a uh, is a key element here. And in this story, in the Popol Vuh, you see the gods getting it wrong, and you see them screwing up, right. and you see them, you know, making a lot of stupid mistakes. Not just in the creation of man, but always coming up against. Ah, oh, boy, we never thought of that happening. But think about that message and what it drives. When you take somebody who is so powerful, like God, and you show that, well, they're not necessarily right all the time. Just because they're so powerful, that doesn't mean anything. Does might make right? Eh, I don't know. These gods are kind of dumb. They keep screwing things up. And if they're so powerful, why do they need to pray for humans? Exactly. That makes them kind of silly and vain. And petty. Exactly. Those are more like Greek gods, quite frankly. Yeah. The Iliad is filled with gods who just want to, you know, uh, be amused by them. Um, that They look at humanity as their reality television. But when you posit that as God, when you say that, okay, God can be uh, kind of a doofus from time to time. God can be kind of ridiculous from time to time. God can even be flat out wrong from time to time. What does that do to your perception of authority? Now take that and transpose it onto the reality that these people are facing, where the Spanish are ruling everything. The Spanish are all powerful to them. The Spanish are practicing genocide. They wipe out most of the native culture around them. They destroy as much culture as they possibly can. We have very few books or anything from them, one of the reasons that we don't have stuff, because there was an active uh, campaign by the Spanish, not unlike the Nazis in Germany, to wipe out anything that might uh, question their authority. A lot of what? Yeah. But that's the thing. There's more than The there were, okay, let's see. The, uh, the Spanish came to the Americas with relatively small forces. Yeah, they and they- They worry about like, the land, right? They did uh, question about the uh, gold. They wanted the gold, they wanted the money, they wanted the slaves, they wanted the converts, but they really wanted the gold. They were worried about the land by now, I think we all do this to be smart. <laughs> well, we'll get to language. We will get more to language in a few minutes. But the uh, they were the natives were in a position of uh, being much more numerous and in their own way uh, more powerful because they knew their culture. They knew their landscape. And the Spanish, as you know, as every colonizing force ever has learned, <laughs> you just parachute into a place and try and run it and you don't know where where everything is, you're operating from a severe sense of weakness. And so you end up making stupid mistakes. And a lot of this story is agitating that and pointing out that the authority figures are making mistakes. The authority figures are not so all-powerful. And if they are not so all-powerful, we can defeat them. We can get rid of them, maybe. This is a couple of generations after that meeting with uh, the, the or that first impression of the, the Spanish and the, uh, the Aztecs, when they were so scared out of their minds at the, uh, the noise of the gun. This is being written at a time when they knew all too well what guns were. Now, again, that is a transcription of a much older text, supposedly. In many cases, multiple texts, written and oral, 
uh, but they are being assembled in this environment of uh, several decades after the fact of the uh, colonization, but it has really soaked in by now. But by this point, you know, they, there is a rebellious spirit at play here where they are able to say that, yeah, the gods are stupid. And if we can only uh, outsmart them a little, we can win in the end. The figures of uh, the, the twins, the hero twins that pop up here, Hanafu and, and, and Jablanke, um, they are, uh, these are fairly standard figures throughout mythology known as tricksters, but they're especially prevalent in, uh, in, in the native cultures of the Americas, who are always fun because they're, they're, they're smarter than everybody around them. They tend to be the little wise asses in the corner. They're the little jokesters who, you know, sit off and snicker in the, uh, the far corner and make fun of the big doofus up in the head of the room. But they outsmart them. They use cleverness and they use ingenuity to get around a lot of the um, a lot of the no-win scenarios that powerful forces tend to set up when they are down in the uh, the underworld. Uh, a trip to the underworld is a standard of mythology. Aeneas went there. Odysseus went there in the Odyssey. Jesus went there to harrow hell. Uh, the the these two are down there because their father and their uncle, also both named Hunapu, which is really confusing. Uh, you know, these are not easy texts to read. Um, they went down there and they faced a series of challenges, and uh, there was this whole thing about the. Here's a here's a cigar and a torch, and you can't let either one burn down before you survive the night, or something like that. And uh, you know, it, they were set up to fail. It was an impossible thing. But when the trickster hero twins come in, they think that out a little bit, and they use their cleverness to get around that. They outsmart the more powerful lords. And in fact, when it comes down to the, uh, this, uh, this, this bizarre game that they play down there, they have figured out how to cheat death. And so they make this game out of uh, they kill a dog and then bring the dog back to life. And all the lords of hell, or uh, uh, what is it, Jabalta? I'm blanking on the word here. Yeah, Jabalba. Uh, all the lords of hell are looking around, and they're cracking up, saying, Ha! Ah, look at the dog! That was great! No, 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 do it to that one over there! Do it to that guy over there! And they go through a series of killing these figures, progressively more complicated, progressively more developed, and bringing them back to life. Now, you can see that a couple of different ways. Number one, it's, uh, it is a sacrifice, but one where there's no value to it because it's insincere. Yeah, sure, kill me, because uh, you're gonna bring me right back to life, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it'll be an interesting story to tell at parties. but it's also a kind of mockery of the very real practice of human sacrifice that we see very vividly described here, where they alternately cut people's heads off or pin them down, I believe anesthetize them a little, but cut out their heart while it's still beating, which is a great scene if you did want to make a movie of this. Uh, yeah, there, this sort of thing has been done before, and it's usually pretty lurid. But uh, the, uh, the idea is that they keep doing this to all of these figures, and these the head gods, the top gods, are laughing and having a great time. All they want is to be entertained. 
all they want is this kind of decadent enjoyment that has no or that mocks the uh, the tradition uh, until they say, "Yeah, do it, do it to me, do it to me, come on, come on, do it!" Yeah. So they go and they kill one and then the other, and the hero twins say, "Well, that was good. Yeah, I don't feel like bringing him back." So they kill the lords of the underworld by making it seem like a game and tricking them into submitting. They went and they put their heads out and said, yeah, cut it off, cut it off. Very similar to the fishermen and the teenagers. Exactly, yeah. The, the, these sorts of stories are all over uh the the thousand and one nights and that sense of the genie is another trickster figure where they're generally pretty clever and they can figure things out and but there's always also that dynamic throughout those stories of like you know the 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 big bad magical genie or the vizier or something like that and like the humble fisherman or servant or somebody who's very weak. The whole frame story of The Thousand and One Nights is uh, Shahrazad, a young girl with no power, who suddenly has the uh, you know the the king, Shah Shariar or Shahr I, I, Sh I think that's Shariar, and then there's Shazma. I get them all confused, quite <laughs> frankly. But that dynamic of the powerful and the weak, but clever, and see how that plays out over and over. And just think about what that drives home. These are generally popular stories. Thousand and One Nights is a great example. It's, these are popular stories, stories told by the people. This is a book of the people. This is not something written necessarily from the authoritarian perspective. But they give this through very subtle symbolism, through very subtle dramatic situations. They give this recurrent uh, theme of uh, rebellion, of overturning the social dynamics that are oppressing them and showing ways, demonstrating ways, to overcome. Not just telling as, you know, many pious people have in every faith ever, never said, well, you just need to endure. Just, this is the way it is. You just got to accept it. Put your head down. Get it over with. Your reward will come in heaven. But this is a literature that whispers to you, you know, you don't have to take that. You're but, um, smarter than that. Newer generations could learn from the past. Yeah. Their, their fathers were killed by the Spalbas. Yeah. But then they kind of knew what was going to happen, and so they kind of looked away. Yeah. To... They used their they used their ability to think. They used their ability to reason based on past experience. They looked at the evidence that they have. They took a critical view of it and said, well, you know, if we just did things a little differently, we would get a better outcome. And that's the Renaissance, quite frankly. That's humanism. The ability to look at, at standard social structures and say, it doesn't have to be that way. How can we change things? That, um, that dynamic is hard to see sometimes. It can seem like just weird stuff happening in this wacky story. The whole bit with the giant parrot is a little bit weird until you realize that, well, the parrot is uh, the macaw is a kind of a silly figure in his own right. He's very proud, and he's, uh, there's much emphasis placed on uh, his dignity and his finery. And when his teeth get knocked out by the hero twins, he is upset because it was, as I believe he uses the word finery, 
and you think about, you know, the vanity of a smile. And even using the, the animal, because parrots usually like they noisy and just talk a lot. Yeah, and that's another aspect of this uh, as well, because all of these mythologies in every culture not only tell you about the culture of the people, but also sit there and spit out ideas about, well, how did everything get started? And that whole bit about the macaw getting his teeth knocked out, when was the last time you saw a macaw with teeth? Uh, that is... That's a fancy word called etiology, where, they, where a story just goes and tries to tell you how something came to be. Um, and it can be something very simple like that. Uh, the, the story in Gilgamesh of the snake. The snake becomes the, or this, well, it is a snake, essentially. The snake that steals the, uh, in Gilgamesh, that steals the, the magic plant that is the tree of life, the of eternal life. That is why snakes shed their skin and thus come out looking like they just had, you know, a, uh, a, a beauty treatment. That's related uh, to the story? What's that? That's related to the story. What story? The snake shedding its skin. Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing in, uh, in, in the end of Gilgamesh. Well, that's not the whole thing. But that's one aspect of it. These are little folktale things that pop up and these are just little stories that you know again like your grandmother would tell you uh, you know why why does the why why is the sky blue grandma and she'll come up with something that has no relation to physics at all but it's usually a cute homey little story that tells you something and here you have these little elements of that story so that's another element of the culture that gets woven into this very subtly and by using those little homey aspects also, it sort of lowers the defenses of the people reading. It's like when they come across something like that, they can say, well, yeah, it's just a, a cute little animal story like all my, uh, you know, like my grandma used to tell me. And then you can maybe not suspect that she is also in this story feeding you little subversive elements of rebellion in, uh, in the story as well. Because there you have another, uh, the, well, it's very complicated, but basically the twins are sort of demigods. They're minor divinities. The bird is a more powerful divinity, but he's still just kind of a, uh, a very low-ranking member of the divine uh, community from the gods themselves. So he is made to suffer because he seems to be so full of himself. But still, it is a rebellion against that authority. It is a uh, bringing them down a peg or two approach that inspires the people. And they'll fold in all of those other elements to make it acceptable so that you know, the Spanish authorities reading this can say, well, okay, yeah, there, there's some weird stuff going on here. It's got a, a wacky bird, and uh, I, I don't know, he gets shot in the, the teeth or something. I don't know. It, it's adorable. It's like a little child's story there, so we're just going to let this go. But just like all children's stories from Aesop through the Brothers Grimm, there can be very dark things look lurking in there that just nudge you a little bit to change the way you think about the world. The, um, I don't want to go over that. The, the final birth of man, after the two botched attempts earlier, uh, comes about uh, kind of late in the story, uh, which is another like confusing element of it. It's like, well, it would be so much easier if it was continuous, but you know, sometimes you gotta accept somebody's gonna go at their own pace and their own trajectory to something. So you just gotta go with that sometimes. But maybe the complexity is to hide other aspects of it. There's always that element. But you see God coming, or the gods, and they fashion flesh out of corn. 
they tried mud and clay and you know they just you know oh what if it rains oh i didn't think about that and suddenly man's a puddle uh or the wood guys the stick men uh that's great but they're kind of stiff they can't really do anything and most importantly uh we are told i'm not sure if it's in this excerpt but we're told that what really sticks in the god's craw about that is well the the stick men uh can't speak and if they can't speak they can't uh sing our praises and tell us how great we are and why are we making them if not for that so they're kind of pointless but they fashion this new man out of corn corn is significant corn is life itself it's a staple food their entire diet is based on honestly corn corn is central and it is everything to them when they knock the teeth out of the macaw what do they replace the teeth with which were made of gold or jewels rather corn yeah corn takes over corn is so special everything is about corn for me it would be coffee but that's me <laughs> but they stick with that and they focus on that and trace the development of humanity itself from that moment. You see them invent, or the gods, well actually it's kind of curious the way it's phrased here, and again, translation is complicated in, in anything. Man is made from the corn, uh, and then women just sort of spontaneously appear. The wives are intended, to uh, make the men content, or as Genesis would put it in the translation we read by Robert Alter, to be a sustainer to man. And then you get development of generations going on. Over time, the gods become a little wary of humanity. The humans very graciously gave thanks for having been made and modeled. They understood everything perfectly. They sighted the four sides, the four corners in the sky and the earth. And this didn't sound good to the builder and the sculptor. Hmm. Doesn't really like it that uh, they're getting so uh, uppity. We have understood everything, great and small, they say. And so the bearer, begetter, took back their knowledge. You think you're so hot? I'm going to make you dumb. That's basically what reality TV executives <laughs> said. What should we do with them now? Their vision should at least reach nearby. They should see at least a small part of the face of the earth. But what they're saying isn't good. Aren't they merely works or designs in their very names? Yet they'll become as great as gods unless they procreate, proliferate at the sowing, the dawing, unless they increase. Well, as, as a dad, I got to admit that kids make you dumb. Uh, but significantly, here the gods are resenting that humanity is becoming too smart, is becoming too powerful, is becoming too grand, that is seen as a threat. And that is the story of the Tower of Babel. In Genesis, humankind builds a tower that reaches up into the sky. And God looks down and says, oh, I don't know about that. I don't like you crowding in on my territory. Uh, how about I make you all speak different languages? So you can't really talk to one another. You can't cooperate. You can't accomplish anything. And that's exactly what happened here. Their deeds would become equal to ours just because their knowledge reaches so far. So the gods give them different languages. The, uh, it's not in the excerpt that you have here, 
but at one point, and the languages of the tribes changed their, their languages became differentiated. They could no longer understand one another clearly when they came away from Tulan. Tulan is their, uh, their main city. So they were all there, but dividing up into tribes, they were becoming too powerful. So the gods gave them all different languages so that they couldn't talk to one another. And there they broke apart. There were those who went eastward and many who came here, but they were all alike in dressing with hides. There were no clothes of the better kind. They, wore, they were in patches. They were adorned with mere animal hides. They were poor. They had nothing of their own. So the gods came in, said, you're getting too big for your britches. That's enough of that. But just think about that exercise of arbitrary power and authority in that instance, where the gods feel challenged by these rebellious people who speak a different language, perhaps. And they decide to divide and conquer. Well, they've already conquered, but they're going to divide and keep them down. Well, that's the story of colonization. Keep them down. That's what Cortez did when he came to Mexico, divided the Aztecs against the other tribes, and ultimately overpowered a much larger force. You create the divisions, you create the resentments, you stir the animosities that are maybe already there, but just need a little tickle to get active. The primacy of the language itself, always in focus, back from the word word in the opening lines, is a very subtle heartbeat through this whole piece. Remember that the Mayans were one of the very few, if not the only, some scholars argue, uh, culture in the, uh, the American continents that had a written language. They understood the value of writing and of language, of words. In preserving a culture, even after it is politically no longer a thing, and in creating a sense of shared experience across many tribes, many lands, many other artificial divisions, words can bring them together. And just this one passage. Alas, we left our language behind. How did we do it? We're lost. Where were we deceived? We had only one language when we came to Tulan, and we had only one place of emergence and orange and origin. We haven't done well, said all the tribes beneath the trees and bushes. They look at language as a unifying element. They look at language as a bond, a sign of their common humanity. And the comment we had earlier, you know, they're talking about a language that largely does not exist anymore because Spanish came in and stamped it out. The power of language is a sense of identity. Your language, how you speak, the inflections you put on it, the voices that you can conjure in your own words or from the words of somebody else, that opens up your mind to whole other worlds, whole other realities, different perspectives. It cracks open your own sheltered reality of all I know is what I want to eat and what I'm afraid of and lets you think in more abstract terms as if 
it were not just the thing in front of you, but as if it were something greater. That's what language can do. It catapults you into new ways of thinking and cracks you out of your narrow hermetic world. That's what classes like this are about. That's why we read all this stuff that, yes, can be a little boring. Yes, can be a little frustrating. And yes, what the hell does that mean? It means nothing. But if you can respect the idea that, OK, it means something, and I just you know got to scratch at it a little to get something out of it. And then if I get something out of it, the text isn't the I can come it's back. A, it's a person. The person writing it, we don't know who's writing this. Exactly. Doesn't matter. We don't know the people. We don't, we don't have to know them. Yeah, I know. That's why we stick with the text. But we are talking about colonial times, so. Sure. But you go back to Homer. I don't know who the hell Homer was. I don't know if he was a real person. I, I really couldn't care less. Would he have been tripped up by the Me Too movement? Who knows? I don't care. What we have is the text. And what we have is an ability to go back and say, well, OK, what does this mean? And how does this one perspective, this one voice, out of a very different world make me look at my world just a little bit differently. Through the power of the words, through the language itself, not through the idea of Homer or the Popol Vuh or Shakespeare or Ernest Hemingway or Steven Spielberg or any of these guys. It doesn't matter. You just have the word. And you can deal with that on your own terms. And that's the fun and that's the benefit. Because you're not the same after you look at something just a little differently and you realize, oh, that's what they're saying? You know? You never really look at anything the same way again. <laughs>